the Villa di Mazer, built by the architect Andrea Palagio at Mazer in Venezia. In about 1560, the Barbaro brothers, members of one of the most important Venetian families, asked the architect Andrea Palagio to build them a country house and the painter Paolo Venizi to decorate the walls. On one of these walls, Veronese painted the villa itself set beside a lagoon evocative of Venice. The building is faithfully reproduced. The countryside is imaginary. The villa is in fact some 50 kilometers from Venice and the sea at Mazer standing below the foothills of the Dolomites. For centuries, the Barbaro family had owned an old building there on the side of a hill where a mountain spring gave water. They ordered the architect to replace it with a villa in the modern style. Built into the slope, it was to have two storeys in the front, but only one behind with an enclosed courtyard. Fifty kilometres to the south, Venice was undergoing a grave economic crisis. The city had lost the maritime supremacy that ensured its prosperity. Exploiting the hitherto neglected hinterland became a priority. Noble Venetians had to leave their city palazzi and spend part of their time each year looking after their lands. This new lifestyle gave rise to a new type of country residence, half palazzo, half farm, known as a villa, the Latin word for the great country mansions of ancient Rome. Some 30 of these prestigious houses were built in Venetia between 1550 and 1580. They are all the work of one man, Andrea Palagio, a former stonemason who had become the favourite architect of the Venetian aristocracy. This type of villa, invented and codified by Palagio, collected together a number of disparate buildings serving different functions, but intended to meld into a homogenous and harmonious whole this was a new architectural ambition, a new concept of beauty. The beauty comes from the form and the correspondence of the whole to the part, the parts to each other and the parts to the whole, such that the building appears as a well-constructed body in which each member fits with the others and where all the members are necessary to do what one wishes done. To be as beautiful as a human body, the building has to be strictly symmetrical. At Mazer, the centre of symmetry is an imposing forepart, the main house mostly taken up with reception rooms. Thrusting forward, it proclaims the nobility of the edifice while at the same time providing the owners with an advanced observation post for surveying their land. The façade of the main house, with its pediment and ionic columns, imitates a temple of antiquity. Antiquity was the model to adopt, the architectural school of the Renaissance. Like his contemporaries, Palagio fed his architectural appetite on the romantic Roman ruins that he drew and measured and whose secrets he tried to discover. But Palagio was the first to take the façade of a Roman temple and stick it onto a simple dwelling, thus inaugurating a Western architectural tradition of decorative facing that lasted up to the start of the 20th century. What was structural in antique architecture here became no more than a sign to enhance the principal façade of the building, to mark the architectural grandeur of the work and the identity of the owner whose arms were displayed on the pediment.
the two wings spreading to the rear of each side of the main house and intended for living and working in, are treated with a simplicity suitable to their more prosaic and intimate character. They each have a wide loggia, an arcaded covered passage that Palagio deemed indispensable to a villa, where the master of the house could go anywhere and oversee everything without being troubled by the weather. But the rhythm of these arcades, reminiscent of grand Roman civil architecture, also make it possible to unify the appearance of two quite distinct buildings. Bracketing the main house are the dwellings. Pushed to the rear are the working areas, barn, stables and wine press, to keep away the pollution of dust and smell. The organisation of living space follows the same common-sense rules that Palagio applied to all his villas. On the ground floor, the domestic quarters, kitchens, outbuildings, servants' lodgings and cellars. On the first floor, the apartments. The façade faces due south, but the arcades protect the living quarters from the sun, at the same time creating a further withdrawal, a stone curtain making a visual transition from the outside to the inside. As with the symmetry, the strict alignment of the openings, until then a rarity in private houses, became a rule for good architecture with Palagio. He said you must always put solid above solid and space above space. In the Villa di Mazer, windows and doors are in strict alignment, except for those at the extremities used for agricultural purposes. Curiously, this part, the least noble, is also the most highly decorated. This is contrary to Palagio's principle that decoration ought to be in accordance with function. But the columns of the arcades as this part of the building are twice as wide as those in the inhabited part. Doubtless the architect sought to attenuate this disparity by hollowing out the columns with niches housing statues to make them seem narrower. Their width is explained by the load they bear, a pediment worthy of the façade of a church, concealing the pigeon lofts necessary for rapid communications with Venice. A wish to dissimulate an over-trivial detail, to give the farm the look of a palazzo, perhaps also to balance the composition by strengthening the set of the wings in comparison with the forepart. On the other hand, nothing marks the incoherence of the meeting point between the main house and the wings, which seem to have been banged together by accident. Nobody today knows the reason for this aberration, which is all the more surprising in that Palagio was constantly preoccupied with melding the different parts into a single whole. But it's true that the only thing that counts here is the overall image when viewed from the front. The design of the façade gives the impression that the main house is divided into two more or less equal stories. In fact, the ground floor apartment, as designed by the architect, had an astonishingly low ceiling, while the ceremonial reception rooms on the first floor are high enough for a palace. They are destined, said Palagio, for all sorts of ceremony, theatre, wedding receptions and other similar pastimes. Four smaller rooms set at the four corners make this room cruciform. The cross-shaped room opens to another room behind that is even more extraordinary in volume and decoration, the Salon of Olympus. The villa turns about this point. It is the extension of the reception rooms and also gives access to the private apartments on each side. From the Salon of Olympus, the bedroom doors are aligned in a row, making it possible to see from one end of the house to the other. Palagio said that that provided gaiety and coolness during hot weather.
Respect for symmetry is strictly maintained. At one end is a portrait of Veronese's wife, at the other is the painter himself dressed for the hunt. The richness of the painted decor conceals an organisation of space based on regularity and repetition. From villa to villa, Palagio systemised his planning to create a positive grammar whose rules could be applied to every circumstance, a priory defining the size and proportions of the rooms. The proportions of the most beautiful and the most elegant rooms that are also the most successful can be designed in seven ways. They can be round, which is not often the case, or they can be square, or their length can equal the diagonal of their square, or a third longer than their square, or one and a half times their square, or a square plus two thirds, or even twice the square. In the apartments of the Villa de Mazère, Palagio simply alternates square rooms with rooms half the square in a relationship of a half. While for the cruciform room, the relationship is based on one third. The composition of the facades reveals the same concern. The parts that show the principal facade and the two extremities are divided into threes three windows, three arcades, although the living quarters have five arcades. This relationship of five by three, the same as the proportions for the cruciform room, is important for Plagio, who ensures that the length of his rooms is never more than twice their width. In the arithmetical relationships that Palagio noted scrupulously on his plans, people have tried to find a theory of harmonic proportion linking architecture, mathematics, music and cosmology. But he was happy enough to state that good proportions satisfy the eye and make for a more convenient and solid construction. What he seems to have been trying to find more than anything else was a rational system that would be suitable for always combining the same elements in ever newer variations. He was the first to propose a standardised approach to architectural composition. He was also the first to publish his own plans, with figures that made it possible to understand and imitate them, right up to supplying his readers with the Vizentia unit of measurement that he used. That was one of the reasons for the extraordinary success of Palladianism and of the influence that he exercised over the development of European architecture. But this success is also due to the pragmatic character of his buildings. The term might seem badly chosen to describe these little country palazzi, but the marble columns and the dressed ashlars of the facades are not merely moulded stucco. For here everything is in brick, from the walls to the pedestals of the statues. That is true for all the Pelagian villas. Despite their grandiose air, they are economically built. There is the same pragmatic attitude regarding the organisation of the access points and flows of circulation. In contrast to usage, there is no grand entrance, nor any monumental staircase in front. Access to the noble areas of the main house is from the side by two sets of stairs, made all the more modest since the architect introduced a passage to connect the two loggias. This is a real transit area where noble and utilitarian paths cross. But Palagio also made it possible for his clients to gain access to their apartments by another way, two private entrances by two staircases rising from the communal areas. These entrances are the only rooms on the ground floor to have painted decorations on the walls. This management of the entry, however discreet it may be, produces a spectacular effect. The visitor goes without any transition from the economic and sober logias to the ceremonial splendour of the first floor, 
from the farmyard to a palatial room in which are discovered the most extraordinary collection of Italian Renaissance frescoes. Veronese painted these frescoes some years after building was completed, following a program apparently established by the Barbaro brothers. Featured here are the favourite themes of Italian Renaissance humanists, gods, goddesses and muses. But what is this painted stool doing here? this dog's head, this cat. These brush and slippers left lying about. What does this ironic depiction of daily life mean? It's a game to taunt and amuse the visitor. The tradition goes back to ancient Rome, where the talent of a painter was judged by his capacity to paint in such a lifelike manner that the eye could be fooled. This trompe l'oeil type of illusion decorated the walls of palaces and villas. During the Renaissance, thanks to the mastery of perspective and the painting of light and shadow, the process was rediscovered and appreciated even more because a painted column was very much cheaper than one in marble or stucco, making it possible to enhance large areas at low expense. This treatment can be found in other Palladian villas, but nowhere else does it go so far in blurring the frontier between real and painted architecture, the true and the false. False is this family portrait painted in false perspective and half hidden behind a false column. False is this window between two false columns and the tree that disappears then reappears behind the cornice. Only the stucco cornice is real, supported by the painted column and the hole left in this column by a German bullet fired at the end of the Second World War. When he wrote about the villa, Palladio made no mention of these frescoes. According to some historians, he had not forgiven Veronese, his friend nevertheless, for opening imaginary doors and windows all over the place, and thus destroying the rational and orderly system that he had constructed. But nothing supports this theory, and the frescoes, far from creating conflict between Veronese and the architect, reflect a world common to both of them that of a dynamic urban culture, sophisticated and sure of itself, like these grand figures representing the Barbaro family that dominates the Salon of Olympus, yet which at the same time is nostalgic for lost grandeur, like all these little people lost in the contemplation of ancient ruins and the river flowing by. The Villa de Mazer keeps a final surprise for the visitor. Taking advantage of the difference in level, the architect put an enclosed courtyard at the rear of the villa on the same level as the whole of the first floor. Completely invisible from the outside, there is a water feature using the spring that was the original reason for the choice of the site.
Once again, this is a borrowing from antiquity. In Greece and Rome, it was known as a nymphium, a sanctuary for nymphs. This monumental fountain built around an artificial grotto is both a place of cult and of relaxation. To the fountain with its statues by the great Venetian sculptor Victoria, Palladio contrasted a rear facade that is remarkable for its sobriety, no doubt seeking to rediscover the atmosphere of the inner courtyards of Roman villas. But he exercised the greatest skill in using the difference in levels of the villa to make the whole of the first floor a link between two worlds, a striking foreshortening between the private area of the Nymphium and the public face, monumental and imposing of the villa of the masters of Mazaire. Fountains follow each other in front of the villa to end at the other side of the road, making the symbolic path of the spring coincide with the symmetrical axis of the building. But this is more than a game. These fountains are the spectacular part of a complex of conduits leading from a large basin built into the hillside for irrigating the gardens and fields. Palagio may not have said a word about Veronese's frescoes, but he proudly described this hydraulic system that combined culture with nature. The fountain was hollowed in the rock in front of the dwelling and highly ornamented with stucco and paint. This fountain forms a small lake that serves as a fish pond from which water flows into the kitchen and then into the gardens on either side of the main road that slopes gradually up to the house. There are two reservoirs, or little ponds, that also provide a watering place on the main road. Then further on, they water the extensive orchards full of excellent fruit trees and all sorts of vegetables. Building the Villa de Mazère in about 1560 was a turning point for Palagio, who in the following years was to become the great architect of Venice and the region. He returned to Mazer one last time in 1580 to build the Barbaro's private chapel, the Tempietto, where, as always, he once again sought to make a synthesis between ancient architecture and the culture of his own time. In this case, he tried to combine in a single building the circular layout of a pagan temple with the cruciform plan of the Christian churches. He died before building was completed, perhaps on site. We are at the theatre. Each evening, the characters sculpted and painted on the walls of the villa perform for the pleasure of the Barbaro brothers, their families and their guests. The performance starts with the creation and ends in the Venetia of the 16th century in a simple private house with its attached farm. The farm is still a farm, but the work is now done in a separate building, built at the start of the 20th century on the other side of the road. Palagio's overall project remains in the architecture. It's not easy to see. The image is blurred by all the columns, all those pediments that for so long disguised the most ordinary buildings as ancient temples. It's partly his bequest to posterity, and also that is where he was the most innovative. To state that a simple country house deserves an architecture worthy of a monument or a temple was to say for the first time that architecture must also consider habitation and daily usage in trying to marry beauty with utility, as Palagio put it, or between form and function, as we say nowadays. <laughs> 